All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that scripture is God breathed and profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, training, and godliness, that the people of God may be perfect and sufficient for every good work. We ask that you would open up our hearts to hear what you have to say, and more than anything, to see Jesus Christ in the scriptures. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. So, Father Chris titled this series, Quiet Miracles. I don't really know what that means. Um, the, the passage he gave me was Matthew 8, 1 through 13, which I happened to preach a sermon on at one point. So I'm probably just going to kind of semi lecturify a sermon that I gave. And then I also have a Bible with commentary here. So at the end, if you guys have questions, we can go through. But it's, it's the passage around two different healings that take place. One is Jesus cleanses a leper. And the second is the faith of the centurion that his servant would be healed. So I'm going to start by reading the passage and then I'm going to go through, we'll do any initial questions related to the passage and then I'll kind of go into it. So Matthew 8, starting in verse 1, when Jesus came down from the mountain, great crowds followed him and behold, a leper came to him and knelt before him saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately his leprosy left him. And Jesus said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a proof to them. And when he entered Capernaum, a centurion came forward appealing to him, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. And he said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion replied, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but say only the word and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who follow him, Truly, I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And the centurion said to Jesus, Go, let it be done for you as you have believed. And the servant was healed at that very moment. And to the centurion, Jesus said, that makes a lot more sense. Go, let it be done to you as you have believed. And the servant was healed at that very moment. All right. Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith. No, not in Israel. So one particularly striking thing about living in Savannah is I've lived at this point in six states. And the experience that I had in Savannah, I don't ever think I've heard more people talk about who they are related to than in Savannah, Georgia, or who they went to school with. Who you know and who you're related to, both here and anywhere else, says a lot about you. Every family has a reputation and a status. And in Savannah, specifically, your family is who you are. Family ties and social ties were also incredibly important in the ancient Near East, the world in which the Bible was written. The people of Israel in Jesus' day knew they were children of promise. 
God had made a promise to their great, 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 great grandfather, Abraham, that he would bless them and make them a great nation. And Israel knew they were heirs of that promise, that they were children of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. And in a sense, today's gospel reading from Matthew is dealing with that very question. What does it mean to be a child of Abraham, an heir of God's promise? Both of the people Jesus interacts with help us answer that question. Matthew places the events of today's gospel shortly after Jesus has given the Sermon on the Mount. This is strategic because it allows Matthew to show Jesus' authority to the readers. First, through his authoritative teaching, the Sermon on the Mount. And second, through his authority to heal the sick. Great crowds are following Jesus because they are amazed at what he has said. Now they are going to be amazed by what he does through healing people. In the first part of the passage, Jesus comes across a man Matthew describes as a leper. Now, leper is sort of a, a junk drawer term, we might say, in the New Testament, for anyone with one of a variety of skin diseases. But the important point for us to know is that according to the law of Moses, this man is ceremonially unclean. He essentially had to social distance from the rest of society. And usually, that meant living outside of the city limits. And it's striking because this man is a Jew. The leopard, the leper, is a child of Abraham. But because he is unclean according to the law, he does not receive the benefits of his heritage. Instead, he's treated like an outsider. Most people would have done whatever it took to stay away from this man because he could make them unclean and then they would be outsiders too. In the law of Moses, there's minimum requirements for staying separated from the rest of society. If you're a leper, it's permanent. If you touch a leper, it's temporary, but it's still at least a week, I believe, that you have to stay away from everybody else. But there is something so compelling about Jesus to this man. The leper comes to him and kneels, showing his great need. The leper, the leper knows he cannot save himself, but he has faith in the one who can. And he says, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And then, because of his great compassion, Jesus doesn't just get near the leper, but he touches him. But in a grand reversal of what you would expect to happen, Jesus does not become unclean. Rather, Jesus cleanses the leper and heals him. His faith in Jesus restored his rightful state as a child of Abraham. So what about the other guy, the centurion? In the next part of the passage, a centurion comes to Jesus. Now the centurion is a powerful man, a military leader in charge of a hundred men. He's also a Gentile. He's not a descendant of Abraham. He comes to Jesus to ask for help. His servant is paralyzed and suffering terribly. And the centurion knows that only Jesus can help. In response, Jesus offers to come to the man's house to heal the servant. But the centurion is clearly aware of Jewish traditions. He tells Jesus there's no need for him to enter the house because entering the house of a Gentile would make you unclean. Jews were not supposed to enter the homes of Gentiles. 
just in the same way that leprosy also makes one unclean. The centurion understood that he is unworthy of having this great rabbi, this teacher, such as Jesus, enter his home. And in great humility and trust in Jesus, the centurion says to Jesus, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. Now, those of you who may be familiar with, um, I think they still say it in the Roman Catholic liturgy, I don't know if anyone knows, but um, when they present the elements, you know, we'll say either um, the gifts of God for the people of God, or behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, Often this verse is used during the elevation, I believe. It's during the elevation. They'll say, Lord, I'm not worthy that thou shouldst come under my roof, but speak the word only, and thy servant shall be healed. And it, it's, 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 it's that posture of humility that us as predominantly Gentiles in this room are able to approach Jesus. And so it's such a beautiful example of faith. So I always think of that liturgical moment whenever I read this passage. So the centurion understands the authority of Jesus. He doesn't need to go to his house. He just needs to speak the word. Excuse me, that was like, I ate the microphone right there. Matthew tells us that Jesus marveled at his response of faith. Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith. No, not in Israel. The centurion understands what few else do. Jesus is the long-awaited Messiah. And what is striking about the passage is the faith of both men. Both the leper and the centurion show a confident trust in Jesus. Both men are outside of the people of God. The leper, because he is unclean, and the centurion, because he is a Gentile. Even though you have no right to ask anything of Jesus, yet humbly, in faith, they trust and they receive from Jesus in that trust. Jesus gives a summary of sorts of both stories. In verse 11, he says, Many shall come from east and from west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. And what Jesus is getting at here is the reality of Gentile inclusion in the people of God. Non-Jewish people, people who are not ethnically children of Abraham, being included in the promise God gave to Abraham. Now that Jesus has come, one becomes a child of Abraham, an heir of promise by faith, both now and in eternity. And as St. Paul says in Galatians, Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And later he says, if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, according to the promise. That's such a powerful claim. Now, having described the great inclusion of the kingdom based on faith, Jesus also gives a warning. There are those who think they are children of kingdom just by right. In Paul's day, <coughs> excuse me, this meant being a descendant of Abraham according to the flesh. For some of us, it means being born into a church-going family. Jesus' warning is for us. Spiritual heritage and birthright are not guaranteed. They can be lost. Unless we follow the leper and the centurion's example of faith. When it comes to your relationship with God, it doesn't matter who your grandfather is, who you're related to. The only way to become a child of Abraham is through faith in Jesus Christ. Paul deals with this question in Romans chapter 3, where he makes it clear that all of humanity, both Jew and Gentile, stand guilty before God and outside the covenant family. And because of this, no one gets to brag about special status or advantage over anyone else in the kingdom of God. 
then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. For we hold that one is justified by faith, apart from works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not also the God of Gentiles? Yes, of Gentiles also, since God is one who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. But of course, the flip side of this is that it's available to everybody. All have sinned, but God has provided a way for all of us to be adopted into the family of God. May we turn from trusting in anything in ourselves, whether giftings, status, or heritage, and turn to Christ in faith, and in so doing, become children of Abraham. And that's normally at the end of the sermon. You say, thanks be to God.